Hey, coaches, I'm excited. We got a, uh, a special guest with us tonight. Darren Sheffer is a high school O-line coach in Virginia, and he is a podcaster. He runs the uh, Armchair Coaching po uh, Podcast, which is a funny story. I, uh, I, I, I stumbled across the podcast. I think I put in culture. I was looking for different podcasts on culture. It came up. So I was playing, I went for a run and I was playing it. And when I got back to the house, he, he DM'd me and wanted me to be on the, uh, on the podcast. So it was, it was, uh, weird how that, that came to get all at once, but Darren, man, I sure do appreciate you doing this. And, and I'm excited to hear your, your kiss philosophy, but I want you to, I want you to plug your podcast at the beginning and then at the end also. So talk about the podcast a little bit. Awesome, Coach. Thank you for having me on. Uh, so the Armchair Coaching Podcast is uh, my way of connecting to the rest of the coaching community. Uh, I'm trying to make connections and share knowledge with other coaches, not necessarily my own knowledge, because uh, as you guys will see in the presentation that I'm going to give, my knowledge is uh, what I would consider very limited, um, but share other people's knowledge and just, you know, building that community uh, and talking about culture, but we talk about lots of other things too. We like to talk about scheme, offense, defense, special teams. Uh, one of the other things that we do, we always do a uh, program profile. And what that is, um, the idea behind that particular series is I, I was walking down the, the road one day. I was like, man, I really like having those conversations in, in the coach's office after practice where, you know, you talk about your favorite college teams or your favorite NFL teams. And you're like, as a high school coach, what do I think is wrong with that team? Or what do I think that team's doing well? Uh, and that's what the, uh, the idea behind the program profile was. It's a non-expert viewpoint of what's going on with the, with the higher programs, right? You know, programs that uh, those coaches are, you know, higher level than we are, probably than I ever will be. Uh, but it's nice to talk about it, right? It's always nice to talk about Clemson football. It's always nice to, uh, you know, around here, it's it's nice to talk bad about the Washington football team. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, we do talk a lot about culture too. Um, pretty much every co coach that I have on, I ask them to describe their leadership philosophy and how they build culture in their program. Because that is, that for this off season, that's been one thing that I've done a real deep dive into was culture. Uh, and so we do try to build that into. So it's basically everything you can think of. It's a hodgepodge of football. Um, so, yeah. But the, one, the, the one I caught, the first one I ever listened to was you were doing the program deal on Ohio State. And, uh, you know, so I got to listen to that the whole time I was running. And then uh, I did happen to see the Washington team the other day, and I really like their helmets. I wish they would have done that before, even when they were uh, – are we allowed to say the other name? But that before when they were called the other name, I, I, I would have liked that helmet then too. Uh, and you did this to me, and it was kind of – it made me think, so I'm going to do it to you. What made you start the podcast, and what, what got you to pull the trigger and get the thing rolling? Uh, a couple of years ago, I had to take a year off of coaching because of certain situations with our family. Uh, and we had just had our first child and there was a, a big deal going on at the school that I was, there was a coaching change and I, I decided to take a year off, but I was going crazy, not coaching, um, because I like to call myself a football junkie. And if so, if I'm not coaching football, I'm not doing football, I want to be talking about football. And so I started a blog a couple years ago and that blog was called obsessed with offense. And I would just talk offense, like all, all different types of offense, air raid, wing tee, whatever. Um, and that kind of tapered off about a year ago. I kind of stopped. It, I didn't stop doing it, but I only write maybe once a month because writing's hard. <laughs> writing's hard. Talking is easy. And the, a lot of the topics that I wanted to talk about would have been pages and pages of writing and I don't think anybody wants to sit there and read that much about football and I, I was thinking about all these ideas of things that I wanted to talk about and I was like I should just start a podcast because I listen to a lot of podcasts uh, I listen to like Joe Rogan I listen to uh, Joe Daniel his coaching his football coaching podcast um, 
I listen to a lot of a lot of different podcasts. I think it's one of the best forms of learning out there. Um, and so I reached out on Twitter because coaching Twitter is is two sides of the coin, right? Either you're going to get some help or somebody's going to tell you you're stupid. Um, but I got a lot of help. I reached out and said, "Hey, anybody who's in, who's done podcasts before, how do you do it? What do you have to get? What do you have to do?" And um, a couple of guys reached out. Uh, Coach Steve, he runs his own podcast. Uh, it's um, the Sideline Podcast with Coach Steve. He reached out and to- told me about what's called the Anchor app, which is a really easy uh, way for you to do your podcast. You can record it straight to- on the app or you can upload everything. And then you do all your editing on the app and it's completely free. They also, once you post it on that app, they send it to everything. So my podcast is on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and a bunch of other platforms. And they do that all for you. Um, kind of a humble little plug for Anchor there. It's just so nice to have that. And then I, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm on your back on that. I, it'd be almost impossible without them. I, I found it through a YouTube video. when I, you know, I do the, the my little podcast, uh, and it, I go through Anchor, and that was like the, uh, the saving grace when I was looking at YouTube videos. How do you do a podcast? And someone finally started talking about Anchor. I was like, oh, thank, thank the Lord. Yeah, I know there's some other ones out there, like I've heard of Podbean and and others out there, but I think a lot of those you have to pay for. And Anchor is, it's easy. Uh, You do have to do some like sponsorships and stuff like that, but that's, if you're, if it's not that hard Um, and you're not like signing away your soul or anything like that. So it was a, it was a gift that uh, he, he showed me that. Yeah, that, I, I'm, I'm with you. So this is, this is another big question you hit me with. What have you gotten out of it? What, what, what has been the, the benefits result from doing, I guess, starting with the vlog and then, and then doing the podcast? Because I, I just find that fascinating. I think the biggest thing I've gotten through the podcast and through the blog is connection with other coaches, especially coaches who have a lot more experience than myself. And it's almost like every time I do a clinic or every time I do a podcast, it's almost like I'm going to another clinic, uh, another coach's clinic. And so if, if you go to a coach's clinic, my, my thought process is I'm not going to try to remember everything they say, but I'm going to try to take little pieces, like little nuggets uh, from each lecture. And so every podcast guest that I've had on, I've learned something new from them. Every single one of them uh, it, without fail, I've learned something new. Um, for example, I had a local co- a D- Division Three college offensive line coach. He came on uh, a couple, two weeks ago, and he runs an, they run an air raid scheme at their college. And he was telling, I was asking him, so like, what kind of pass pro drills do you run you know, for offensive line? And he was telling me all these different drills that I had never heard of. And I'm just sitting there like, that makes so much sense. And so I stole every every drill from him after the podcast i made him like diagram them out for me and i i wrote it all wrote it all down but i think i've learned more by doing this podcast than i ever did going to coaching clinics um just reaching out to coaches meeting new coaches i've had coaches from california i've had coaches from oregon florida um all over the country texas couple coaches from Texas have been on. Uh, I recently today just uploaded the episode. We had the offensive line coach Garrett Touje from uh, University of Virginia. Um, he came on. I met him at a clinic a while back and uh, he agreed to come on because he said he remembered me. I'm not sure if he really did, but uh, <laughs> you know, he was, he was nice enough to come on and talk and we had a really nice discussion. Um, it's just, if there's one thing, like if any coaches out there are interested in starting their own podcast, even if you don't think you have much to offer, you do um, in your own way. And the biggest thing you're going to get is the connection with the people that you have on your podcast. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on your back. Uh, not, not only the people you meet and the connections you make, but like you said, they're, you're always going to pick up something and, you know, I don't know if I said it on your podcast, but the I talked to a, a, a guy last week and he gave a play that I've run for years. He gave me one little detail that was different and it just changed the whole play for us. And now 
I, I really think that play is going to be one of our best plays this year because that one little tip he gave me that I'd never thought of before. So, yeah, it's uh, – and, and we talked about – we joked about it on your podcast. You don't make any money, but you make, but you get a lot of good out of, out of doing it. And I'm with you. I'd, I'd encourage anyone that uh, wants to do the YouTube thing or the or the podcast thing to jump in there because the benefits are just uh, as long as you're not looking for a paycheck, the benefits are out the gate. All right, man. So I appreciate you doing that part. So I'm excited. Uh, you're gonna take us through your Kiss philosophy, and uh, and we're ready to learn, man. Awesome. Let me share my screen. All right, so I've I've been doing online uh, online teaching for a while now, uh, a couple of weeks now, and so I've gotten used to. Uh, well, I'm getting used to Zoom, so uh, you guys can bear with me. Hopefully, uh, I can get through this. So, uh, again, my name is Coach Sheffer, uh, and today I'm not really going to be doing a whole lot of offensive line stuff. Um, this is my first year as being the official offensive line coach. I've been an assistant O-line coach before, assistant defensive line. Uh, the last couple of years I've spent as a linebackers coach at the school that I'm at. So I've been kind of going back and forth. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I have a whole lot of offensive line knowledge to impart at, at, at the moment. Hopefully I will hear soon. But this is something that um, – I've actually, I've given this uh, lecture. It's kind of a lecture because I'm a teacher. I've kind of uh, given this lecture before. So this isn't really new. Um, it's something that I'm very passionate about. And I'm passionate because of personal experience with dealing with this. Uh, and I'll, ta I'll tell the story here in a little bit. So a uh, quick bio about myself. You, uh, I'm not going to plug my podcast again, I promise. Um, so if you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter at Darren Sheffer. Um, I do still run the blog called Obsessed with Offense. Uh, you can find me on YouTube as well. Uh, Coach Sheffer is my YouTube channel. This is my sixth year coaching in Virginia, uh, here specifically in Northern Virginia in three different schools. Uh, and so a lot of your, your listeners uh, probably have a little bit more experience than I do uh, in, in years. And they're probably going to say, well, why am I listening to this young coach, this young buck who really doesn't know anything? Uh, and I'll agree with you guys. I, I, I will be the first to admit I don't know anything, right? And I had that beaten into me pretty early in my coaching career. I was that coach that thought they knew everything, thought that they could run everything and, and be the next Nick Saban or the next Urban Meyer. And I had that beaten into me early on that I knew nothing. Um, and not necessarily by any person, it was just by personal experience. And so that definitely humbled me. And I'll tell you some uh, examples about that here in a little bit. Uh, I've held various titles as a coach, assistant offensive line and defensive line coach and film coordinator at my first job. Then I moved because I got a teaching job at another school. I became the head freshman coach at a larger high school, a, a 6A school here in Virginia. So 6A is the biggest division. Um, that's I'm going to focus on that story here in a couple of slides. More recently, I moved uh, due to family purposes closer to home, and I'm at a much smaller school, a uh, a 3A school here in Virginia, which is a lot smaller. We have in Virginia 3A is about a thousand students around that area, um, so this is more of like a, a average size school here in Virginia. Uh, it's small for Northern Virginia, but for the rest of Virginia, it's pretty average. I, the last two years, I've been coaching linebackers. And so before then, I thought of myself solely as a offensive coach. And I never really focused on defense. And thank God for my current head coach for forcing me to be a linebackers coach. Uh, because I'll tell you a quick story. The day that he interviewed me for the job at this particular high school, his name's Coach Molinax. He put me up on the board, put a couple offensive formations up and said, okay, draw a defense up. How would you defend this? And I don't remember exactly what I drew on the board, but I'm pretty sure I made a fool of myself because I will be honest. I had, I knew nothing about, you know, alignments and all that kind of stuff. I played defense in high school, but that was about it. And so uh, being on the defensive side of the ball has, in my opinion, made me a better offensive coach because 
Now he, he took me under his wing. He was a defensive coordinator and I learned the process of what defensive coordinators are thinking throughout the week, how they pl game plan for an offense, where the weaknesses and coverages are, where the weaknesses in different fronts are. And so now I know that from the defensive side of the ball as an offensive line coach, I'm going to use that knowledge so that I can attack the other defenses that we're going to see each week. And so if you're an offensive coach and you never coached defensive ball, I highly recommend it because you will learn way more than listening to, um, you know, some offensive guru out there uh, talk about, you know, offense and then they draw up a defense. And I, every time, and I'm not, uh, and Coach Silas, you don't do this. Thank goodness. I, I will say there are some uh, guys on YouTube and Twitter who are definitely offensive guys who, when they try to draw a defense up on the board, I'm like, yeah, that's not how we line up to that. <laughs> so um, it's interesting. You, you, they got to get a defensive guy in that film session. Uh, but now I am the offensive line coach. Um, but today we're talking about the KISS philosophy. Uh, and this is not a philosophy I came up with. I do not take credit for this. You know, uh, there's nothing new in football. And it, there's nothing wrong with that, right? You take what's wor what works and um, you adapt it to yourself. Uh, my personal philosophy has come from listening to multiple other coaches and also from personal experience. So these are some of the coaches that you guys might be familiar with, uh, either from YouTube or Twitter or other places. So you might know of Nate Allball. He runs the Chief Pigskin Online Clinic. He also does a lot of YouTube stuff now. Um, I've been a big follower of him ever since he was doing his film Friday video, his film, uh, yeah, film Friday videos on YouTube. Those were amazing. Uh, Joe Daniel, I listen to his podcasts all the time. So uh, a lot of the ideas come from him as well. Coach Rick Stewart from All Access Coaching. You guys are probably familiar with him. You might know him as the pistol wing T guy. Um, I got a lot of ideas from him, M more so the program and the culture building side, not necessarily the, uh, uh, the X's and O's. And then Kenny Simpson, uh, more recently, he's the new, he know, he's known as the, uh, the gun T, the gun wing T with the RPO system. And his big thing that really resonated with me was getting the most bang for your buck, you know, uh, and not necessarily just buck sweet, but getting as much out of a play as you possibly can before trying to add more stuff. Uh, and that really resonated with me. And obviously there's other coaches that I haven't mentioned on here. Um, and I'm those, sorry. Those are four pretty good ones right there. Now I've stolen a lot from those guys myself. Yeah, they are. Um, there's other coaches out there, you know, ones that I deal with personally that most of the coaches on your channel probably wouldn't know. Um, but a lot of this is coming from personal experience as well. So what do I view as the KISS philosophy? Sorry, I get dry mouth. Um, what does KISS stand for? It says it stands for keep it simple, stupid, right? And to me, it's not saying that you keep your system stupid. It's saying, hey, you stupid, keep it simple, right? Calling yourself stupid, right? Um, and what that means is you're gonna, you need to keep your, your scheme simple for the kids. But to the outside viewer, you're gonna make it look complicated, right? So you're going to put the mental burden on yourself because that's your job as a coach that uh, you shouldn't be putting the mental burden on the kids. This is something that um, my person, I really respect my head coach, the one, the guy that I work for right now, but this is something he and I uh, disagree on. Uh, his personal philosophy is he says the cream will rise to the, to the top and he's going to front load heavily front load the kids with information and the kids that retain the information and are able to use it are the ones who are going to play. You know, sometimes there's kids out there, let's just say they're not the sharpest tack when it comes to the mental skills, but I'll be darned if I'm not putting them on the football field, you know? And so I'm going to try to keep the mental burden off of that kid, make it simple enough that um, you can instill confidence in your players. So one of the things that Joe Daniels always says is, uh, you know, play fast, and win games and he says if your kids are confident they're going to play fast right if your kids are not confident in themselves they're going to look slow because they're they're hesitating 
So if your kids are confident and they're not hesitating, they're going to play fast, they're going to play hard, and you're going to win a lot of ball games, right? Um, a lot of this also comes from the fact that I'm a teacher. And as a teacher, to me, this is something I, I, I thought of a long time ago because I'm a science teacher. I teach a lot of vocabulary. As in science, there's a lot of tough vocabulary. And that's, that's specific just to science. And a lot of these kids don't know that, so you got to teach it. And so learning plays is a lot like learning vocabulary. How do you learn vocabulary? It's a lot of memorization and a lot of repetition, right? So if you have an offense where you have 10 different run schemes, how many reps in practice are you actually going to get? Not a whole lot. I've heard some people say, um, I don't know if I would go to this extreme, but I've heard certain coaches say that if you run a play in a game one time, you should have practiced that play at least 10 times in practice throughout the week. So imagine you're a zone team and you're running inside zone, outside zone. If you run inside zone 20 times a game, how many times, how many reps should you be getting in practice that week? It, according to that rule, about 200 is, you know, if my math is correct, I'm not a math teacher, thank goodness. Um, and so you need to keep your, your plays simple, your playbook simple, because you need to get reps. And if you have a lot of plays, you're not getting a lot of reps, your kids aren't going to be confident in themselves, and they're not going to play fast. And I've seen that from personal experience. Obviously, there might be some exceptions to this rule. And some coaches might be saying, well, I have lots of plays and my kids do just fine. Um, you know, other things might work for you, but it didn't work for me. I had a really good coach on my podcast last week, uh, Coach Arnett from Houston, Texas. He is an offensive line coach. And this is his, he was talking about how at his school, he has enough players because they're a large school in Texas. He has enough players that they two platoon. And even a two platoon team, I've never been a two platoon team, never. So I've never had that experience of having kids that only play offense or kids that only play defense. So you've got kids that are going both ways for the most part. And this is, this really stuck with me. This is one of those things I picked up from his uh, podcast. His philosophy when it comes to the KISS philosophy is that for the kids, a play, learning a play is like learning calculus. It's hard and it takes a lot of mental processing to learn a play. But formations are like learning geography. It's easy because it's memorization. So geography is easy to memorize, it's easy to do, it's easy to go. Learning new plays is a lot harder. Now, obviously some kids aren't good at geography. So, you know, obviously this isn't for everyone, but in general, learning new plays is hard, but learning formations is easy. So if you're able to have a couple of plays that you're really good at, but have lots of formations and run those plays from all those formations, you're gonna to be tough to defend. Because as a defensive coach, a team that has a lot of formations that you have to align to, you got to practice to aligning to all those formations and be in the right alignment and then be ready to defend their, that team's best play. Um, now, my head coach says that teams that run a lot of formations are pretty predictable. Yeah, that can be true. If you only run a certain play from a certain formation, yeah, you're going to be pretty predictable. If you line up in that formation, I'm pretty sure I know what play's coming. But if you can run three or four offensive uh, run, run schemes and you can run all of those run schemes from every formation, you're going to be hard to defend. So here's some things to consider. As a high school coach, what's the age range, age range of kids that you're going to be dealing with? You're dealing with kids that are anywhere from 13 to 18 years old in high school. If you're in middle school, it's going to be younger. What's happening at that time period? These kids are going through puberty. There's a lot of stuff going on with the, you know, I'm younger. I still remember what puberty was like. It sucked. Okay. Um, I remember the hormones. I remember, uh, coach, I'm not sure if you want me to curse on here or not. <laughs> so I, uh, I remember what it was like being a teenage boy, right? It was confusing. 
I had a very short attention span and I was constantly thinking about things other than football. Um, so there's a thing that uh, coach, coach Rick Stewart was talking about. There's three G's. There's three G's that will kill a kid's, a, a young man's football career. Grades, gangs, and girls. And girls are undefeated. They always win, right? Especially with, kid, with kids who have raging hormones. And don't forget, they're also going through school at the same time too. They've got homework. They've got all that kind of stuff that they're, they're uh, worried about. And depending on the state you're in, you've got limited amount of time of practice. Like you can only practice for a certain amount of time. So there's only so much you can actually legitimately fit into your playbook and be able to practice and be ready for in a game, right? And don't forget, you've got to practice defense. You've got to practice special teams. You've got to practice situation football. If you're an up-tempo team, you've got to practice your tempo. Um, you've got a lot of stuff you've got to get in, right? And if you're a culture guy, you've got to coach your culture too. So there's a lot of stuff you've got to be figuring out here. Um, and so I had to learn this all the hard way and a couple of, uh, coaches that I like to quote here, PJ Fleck, he always says that failing equals growth, but failure is quitting. So if you're failing, you're trying and you're failing, but you're never quitting, you're growing. Right. And that really stuck with me, especially with this kiss philosophy. Uh, failure is the best teacher by far. And there's a story that I want to tell you that's all about failure. It was my second year as a coach when I became the head ninth grade, uh, the head coach of the ninth grade team at uh, a large school in Virginia. We were dealing with 13 and 14 year old boys. Uh, and let's just say we did not have a very good season when it came to numbers, right? Uh, on my blog, I haven't talked about this on my podcast yet. I don't know if I will. It's still, it's still a tough memory sometimes. Um, I've talked extensively about that season, and I call it, uh, it like all the, the, the writings from that are called 0 and 8, you know, how a losing season made me a better coach. And I really believe it do, did make me a better coach. Part of my – from retrospect, part of my problem was that I was young. I thought I knew everything. Um, and then, you know, I kept changing the offense – we came out to a scrimmage and we were, um, we were in pistol two by two, lots of diamond. And we were running power read. We were running jet sweep. We were running bubbles inside zone. None of it worked. None of it. And so, you know what I did that next week, I scrapped the whole offense and I went to something different. Um, one of the toughest, one of the things that we were never able to figure out that year was the shotgun snap. I wanted to be spread so bad because I was a huge Ohio State fan at that time. I, I loved what they were doing on offense. I wanted to do what they were doing on offense, but we couldn't get the shotgun snapped down. So we had to go under center. Uh, and then I started adding too many plays. I was like, okay, I need a play to do this. I need a play to do that. I need a counter off of this. you know. And then I basically did what a lot of young coaches do. I took a bunch of plays off of Madden that I liked, and I tried to make an offense, right? It was a hodgepodge of a bunch of different stuff that didn't make any sense. You know, I had formations for things that, like I said, they were very predictable. And for the first half of the season, I kept changing. Every week, I'd find something different. You could you could have at least said you you got we're taking plays off of Monday Night Football. When you say you were taking them off of Madden, that, that just shows your, your age or one of it shows either your age or my age. But, you know, that's such a, that's such a common uh, pitfall for all coaches. When things aren't working, you start looking for the magic play. Exactly. That's what we were doing. I, I kept researching different offenses. And, like, I think about week three, we found – one of my assistant coaches sent me the uh, website to it was the uh, the pistol triple option website and i was like man let's do that cuz that looks awesome right you know their their offense is clicking you know and the first four games we averaged like one offensive touchdown per game it wasn't very good it wasn't pretty 
luckily our defense we we kept our defense pretty simple and because I was trying to focus on offense and so I didn't know how to coach defense so we kept it simple and we were okay you know we had some a couple of good athletes who helped us out but um first couple of games we got blown out bad uh you know the schedule didn't help we were playing some tough teams but we were not very good uh and so before I move on to the next thing, what we ended up doing like around halfway through the season, I sat the other coaches down. I was like, look, whatever we're doing is not working. The kids look scared when they're on the field. They don't know what they're doing. They're messing up the plays. You know, we thought it was pretty simple as a coach, but I wasn't thinking about what I was saying earlier. You know, I wasn't thinking about the, the age of the kids. I wasn't thinking about them dealing with, with school I wasn't thinking about the fact that these kids might not be as interested in football as I am. You know, there's a reason I got into coaching is because I love football. They probably are playing just because they're bored, right? They might not love it as much as I do. And so they're not going to spend as much time on it as much as I do, am. And so what we did, we decided, okay, we're going to keep it as simple as we possibly can. We ran one formation so that we didn't have to learn any new formations. And we ran, uh, so we had done the pistol triple option. And do you want to know what the, the biggest thing that, that kept us from running it was that darn pistol snap. We still couldn't get that. Um, that and the mesh reads, the quarterback kept looking at the fullback when he was supposed to be looking at the defensive end, even though we'd practice it about 100 times a week. It just didn't work out. And so we, we cut out the option but we kept the formation. We kept the under center flex bone, which, which is pictured right here. Uh, we went under center and we ran three plays, three run plays, toss, counter, and fullback dive. And each one had a motion. Uh, it was the same motion. And so we called it the same way every time. So it was toss, counter, and dive. And then we ran three pass plays. We ran a, now screen, a, a quick screen to the receivers. We ran uh, what we called scissors where the outside receiver would run a, uh, a post, the Z or uh, the wing back is what we called them. We call them the wing backs. He would run a corner route and they would kind of, uh, they, what did we call it? I think we called it cross. No, we didn't call it scissors. We called it cross and they would cross each other. And so usually one of those guys got open. Usually it was uh, our wing back was wide open when we would run it. Cause we'd run the, uh, the play action, the toss fake behind it. And so the defense would run up and there'd be nobody there on that corner. Uh, so we'd run that about five times a game. It'd be open just about every time. And then we ran like a toss pass where we faked, we uh, faked the toss, gave it to the fullback because our little fullback actually had a decent arm. He should have been playing quarterback for us the whole time. I didn't figure that out to our last game. Uh, but he was about four foot tall. So I wasn't willing to put him in there. He would get it out on the edge and he'd, and we'd run like a go route. And uh, that worked out pretty well for us too, because we had a decent receiver. When we started doing that, and that's all we did, and we started getting good at it, we started to increase our offensive production. It, we went from the first four games of getting maybe one offensive touchdown a game to and averaging about three or four offensive touchdowns per game. And I think our final game, we scored 35 points, which was unheard of for the beginning of the season. And we almost won. The last two games came down to the last couple of plays. We almost won those last two games. Um, but for us, you know, in our situation, the major thing that we changed was that we simplified everything. And so imagine – what you guys could do with your offense. If your offense is struggling and your kids aren't playing fast, they look like they're playing slow, they look like they're scared, I would take a look at your playbook, right? I'm not saying you have to throw your playbook out. I'm not saying that you have to throw out your scheme. If you're air raid, stay air raid, right? But look at ways that you might be able to simplify. Don't try to run every single air raid passing concept because there's a lot of them, right? And your kids are going to get confused. So here are some things that I would tell you. So my current KISS philosophy, if I were an offensive coordinator or a head coach, 
Okay. I'm not right now, but if I were, what I would want to do, I would want to sit down with my other coaches and probably sit down with a couple of the seniors and have like a little leadership council and say, look, what I want to do, I want to build our offense around one play. Typically it would be a run play. Okay. So for example, we can say, I want to build my offense around inside zone. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start there. That's the first thing I teach. And I'm going to build the rest of my offense around it. So what I would do is get good at that play, get good to great at that play, make that my cornerstone play. If that's the, it's fourth and three and you need a first down, what are you going to call, right? What's the, what's the thing that you hang your hat on? Some people it's power. If you're a wing T, it might be buck sweep, right? Uh, if you're air raid, I don't know what you're running. It might be mesh, it might be stick. Uh, my personal air raid favorite is the uh, shallow cross, but um, get good at that play, right? Make that your cornerstone of your offense. That's what you're known for. Well, there's a lot of programs out there. They're known for a certain play. If you're single wing, it might be quarterback power, right? Get known for that play. And then what you can do is you run that play, have a counter off of that play. So some kind of counter the opposite way and then have a play action off of that play, all right? And that's where I would start. So you got three plays, a series, just from that. And then, for example, the reason I use inside zone, I think that's probably the most versatile run play there is in football right now, is the inside zone. And that's coming from a guy that some people – will tell you that I'm a wing T guy or a triple option guy. I'm not, I'm an all offensive guy. Uh, the inside zone is probably the most versatile run play that there is. Some people may argue with me, but there are so many things that you can do off of inside zone. You can run zone read, you can run RPOs, you could run triple option off of inside zone. I know there are some under center triple option teams out there that have gone away with the veer blocking and have gone straight up inside zone blocking and it's worked for them. You could be like uh, New Mexico was a couple of years ago, be in the be spread, but your triple option or uh, Georgia Southern right now, who's the, the spread option team right now that's doing really well. I think it's uh, coastal Carolina, you know, and they're not, you know, a lot of the stuff they're doing is off of inside zone and you watch and it looks like they're complicated, but if you're watching up front for the offensive line, they're running the same stuff. Right. And so I've worked with my offensive coordinator on this, this year, you know, we run, we run uh, jet sweep, but one of our biggest plays on our offense is wide zone. Um, and we, we call it, we call it stretch, but it's really, most of you guys will know it as wide zone because our running back is reading the block of the tackle and he, it's more of an off tackle play because we want him to cut it upfield. Um, well, that's one of our biggest plays and wide zone takes a lot of practice time. Right. And so we want to get really good at that. So what did we do this year? Um, we are going to marry the wide zone blocking scheme to our jet sweep. We're going to marry the wide zone blocking scheme to our toss play. So we have jet sweep, toss, uh, outside or wide zone, and to the offensive line, it's the same thing. So I get more practice time at, as an offensive line coach for coaching one blocking scheme, but you get three plays out of it. Not to mention, we're also going to be running some play action and some RPOs off of it. Uh, and so you've got mo multiple plays that you can attack multiple spots of the field but really you've only really installed one thing up front, right? And so for us as an offensive line coach, that's a way that you could keep things simple. Um, yeah, sorry, coach. I, I, I kind of uh, fizzed out there, but um, that's my current uh, KISS philosophy. And uh, that's, I think it will work for anyone. Uh, if you're, I think it'll work for anyone who's struggling with the air raid it work for people who are struggling with wing T doesn't matter what offense you run. If you find that your kids are playing slow and they're not confident in themselves and you want them to play fast and be confident, I would look into trying to simplify your offense as much as possible. Great job, man. I love it. I, I, uh, I think when I was a young coach, I got my, brains beat out by an old crafty veteran that ran about five plays 
and he just ran them over and over and over again until he was a lot better at it than you were. So uh, it still didn't stop me from doing the young coach thing and, and uh, panicking and trying to find the right, the perfect play. But, uh, you know, it's always a reminder that, uh, you know, those, I call it the, the, the veterans that'll stick to the knitting. You know, they got their offense, they got their plays, and they're just going to run those plays over and over and over again until they get good at them. And if I could give the, the listeners a real-life example of this, of a school that's a program that they're probably familiar with, look into Oklahoma. What is Oklahoma doing with their run game? I would say at least 60% of what they run is that GT counter. And I guarantee you they probably practice that 300 times a week. <laughs> Uh, and you watch all the different things they do off of that one blocking scheme and how much practice time that offensive line coach gets to teach that one blocking scheme. If you want a real life example of this working out, look at Oklahoma and uh, that that's a good example for you. That, that'd be a great one. Well, buddy, uh, plug, plug your podcast one more time. You did it and you did a great job, buddy. That was, that was fantastic. I, I appreciate that, Coach. Um, so if you're interested in the podcast, you can search for us. We are on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, uh, Anchor, as well as many other podcasts. Uh, we're also available on YouTube. I have a guy who's been doing some uh, YouTube video editing for me, and he's been showing me some sneak peeks of these videos that are about to come out, and they look amazing. And so you can find us on YouTube. Uh, it's the the Armchair Coaching Podcast. If you're looking for me on YouTube, just look up Coach Sheffer. Um, if you're interested in all things football, then that's what you're going to want. And if anyone is interested in, in uh, coming on to the podcast, uh, feel free to contact me on Twitter. I'm not going to give out my email address yet, but uh, I will openly talk to you guys on Twitter. So uh, it's uh, ahead, give, give, at Darren Sheffer. Yeah. Twitter, the Twitter handle is at Darren Sheffer, D-A-R-R-I-N-S-H-E-F-F-E-R. So find me on Twitter, uh, you know, follow me there and you can send me a DM or uh, comment me and I'll try to get you guys on the, the podcast. Perfect, man. Appreciate you doing this. I appreciate it, coach. I, thank you for coming on my podcast as well. You did an excellent job on our podcast and I'm excited for that episode to come out too. Well, I appreciate you, you having me on there, and, uh, and I'll be listening. Uh, every one of the uh, episodes that I've heard so far have been uh, fantastic, all thought-provoking, and, uh, you know, it's fun to hear different coaches talking about the programs. And I caught, I caught one of your interviews the other day. That was really good. So you're doing a great job, and you did a great job tonight. I appreciate you doing this, man. Thank you.